the first of our two virtual presentations, and we now move on to the second one by Catherine Bursch of the University of Western Ontario, who's going to discuss Arthur Kingsley Porter and the art of the pilgrimage roads. Yes, lamento, no poder estar en Santiago con ustedes. This paper explores an extraordinary North American chapter in the invention of modern discourse on the art and visual culture of the Camino. My focus is the Harvard medievalist, Arthur Kingsley Porter, who in 1923 put Santiago de Compostela and the Camino on the international map with his book, Romanesque Sculpture of the Pilgrimage Roads. Published less than four decades after Pope Leo XIII authenticated St. James's relics, this massive 10 volume study played a key role in creating and mobilizing knowledge about the Camino's artistic culture. Unfettered by tradition, the American challenged the nationalist views of medieval artistic production propounded by many of his European colleagues. He proposed instead that the pilgrimage roads to Santiago de Compostela, Rome, Bari, Jerusalem, and elsewhere had been vital arteries of communication that united medieval Europe and much of the Mediterranean, hence permitting the free flow of artistic ideas across geographies, cultures, and ethnicities. Because Porter's vision of a vast international network of multi-directional exchange disrupted nationalist-driven concepts of cultural priority, particularly those espoused in La France, his writing sparked controversy. But the wealthy American had supported his theories by employing the cutting edge technologies of the car and the camera on an unprecedented scale, making it impossible to overlook his work. For a century now, this landmark publication has provided a rich source of provocation for students and scholars of the Camino. Our international conference provides me with a welcome opportunity to analyze and contextualize the knowledge production of this new world scholar who was the first to imagine, interpret, and animate the pilgrimage to Santiago in comprehensive visual as well as textual terms. No armchair scholar, Porter did so bodily eager to clamber up mountains or punt across rivers in search of unknown Romanesque churches. He set out with a chauffeured automobile, cameras, and his collaborator, his wife Lucy, a gifted photographer, to experience and document the Camino's visual culture at first hand. The results were dazzling. More than 1,500 photographs of 11th and 12th century sculpture in present-day Italy, France, and Spain accompanied Porter's one volume of text, opening up the study of Romanesque art to scholars around the globe. Until the arrival of the internet, there was no comparable visualization of artistic monuments along the pilgrimage roads. But this wasn't Porter's only contribution. His widely circulated work, including a two-volume book on Spanish Romanesque sculpture, published in three languages in 1928, forever transformed the perception of Spain's medieval cultural patrimony. Rejecting the prevailing view that the art of the Iberian Peninsula was merely a provincial reflection of ideas formulated in France, Porter portrayed the region as a locus of immense artistic creativity and originality, engaged in vibrant interchange with the rest of Europe and the Mediterranean, often giving more than it received. Porter's keen interest in Spain and the Camino carried forward in the work of his Harvard students. Kenneth Conant published a groundbreaking dissertation on the Cathedral of Santiago de Compostela in 1926, and Walter Muir Whitehill, inspired by a visit to Santiago with Porter in 1927, transcribed the text of the Codex Calixtinus in collaboration with the Seminario de Estudios Galegos. 
As a prime mover in the invention of discourse about the pilgrimage roads to Santiago, the scholar adventurer Porter has been the subject of much myth-making over the years. The New Englander has been portrayed as a kind of American cowboy of Romanesque art who opened up the wild west of Europe by tirelessly exploring its most remote frontiers, including Apulia and Galicia. Keeping the theme of our conference session in mind, my objective today is to introduce you to my project to balance this mythology with the nuts and bolts, or what we might call the reality of Porter's pioneering scholarship on the Camino. To date, very little critical attention has been directed to the specifics of the personal, intellectual, and ideological circumstances that animated the Americans' early 20th century thought. I am currently writing a book that draws on Porter's unpublished papers and photographic archive at Harvard in order to map and analyze his scholarly imagination in the years between 1900 and 1933, the year of his premature death. My research responds to questions that intrigue us all. How did Porter manage to manufacture so much knowledge about the visual culture of the pilgrimage roads a century ago? And even more fundamentally, how did this New Englander come to study medieval pilgrimage and Romanesque art in the first place? Before addressing these questions, let's first turn to the material product of Porter's research, namely Romanesque sculpture of the pilgrimage roads, published in Boston in 1923 at Porter's own expense. Because he not only did the research for the book, but also funded its production, he determined its physical character, which mirrored his vision, articulated at the outset of his career, of a medieval Europe, quote, constantly in motion, end quote. He thus left the 1527 half-tone plates imaging sculpture along the Camino unbound, reflecting his conviction that images, whether mobilized via the travels of artists or clerics, by trade, warfare or other means in the Middle Ages were powerful agents of cultural transmission whose forms and meanings were constantly in flux. Intended by Porter to be manipulated, the photographic representations, which objectified vestiges of artistic culture along the Camino for the first time, could be arranged and reconfigured in endless combinations and supplemented by images drawn from secondary sources, the print media or elsewhere. Their meanings, interconnections and narratives were not fixed. When spread out on a desk or pinned to a vertical panel in the manner of Abbey Warburg's celebrated Bilder Atlas, likewise conceived in the 1920s, Porter's atlas of images facilitated the imagining of relationships and cultural flows among works of different geographies or historical eras. This physical and conceptual flexibility appealed to the many Europeans and Americans whose thought was energized by these new and highly suggestive visual stimuli. For Porter, as in the case of his contemporary Warburg, the image was always in motion and its meaning was open-ended. Owing to Porter's perpetual travels, his research practice was constantly in motion as well. This American produced tsunami of images and text was pivotal to the commodification of art and visual culture along the Camino, giving impetus to scholarship, collecting both private and museological, the protection of cultural patrimony and heritage tourism. Porter's accompanying text was revolutionary too, because he barraged his readers with a dizzying array of hypotheses about the transmission and dissemination of artistic ideas across great distances, positing stylistic and iconographic ties among works of diverse cultures and media, for example, comparing sculpture from 11th century Iberia 
to Byzantine mosaics, Renaissance painting, and Anglo-Saxon manuscripts in a single paragraph. Departing from normative Ile-de-France-centric dogma, he suggested that artistic invention happened at multiple sites simultaneously, proposing that the far-flung travels of itinerant artists, pilgrims, clerics, and traders had been the primary mechanism facilitating a sharing of ideas that did not conform to modern political borders. The plenitude of new data and unorthodox theories presented by Porter helps to explain why later scholars were concerned with refining or refuting his attributions and chronologies rather than probing into how he arrived at his novel ideas. Yet the imaginings contained within the covers of this legendary publication had a long history. Porter was an experienced scholar of art history by the time he produced this opus, having published a two volume work on medieval architecture at the age of 26 and a four volume book about 11th and 12th century Lombard architecture that appeared between 1915 and 1917. Trained at New York's Columbia University as an architectural historian, an interest that he also brought to his analysis of the Camino, Porter became increasingly engaged with the medium of sculpture during his investigations in Lombardy, convinced that figural representation was the most expressive constituent of a medieval building. This was also the time when he adopted the modern camera and automobile as the material basis of his scholarly practice, recognizing that they could accelerate the tempo of his research into the medieval past. He conducted extensive on-site research in Lombardy in 1909 to 1910, and again in 1912 to 1913, this time aided by his partner, Lucy, whom he married in 1912. This remarkable photograph shows the honeymooners in their Isotta Fraschini touring car, identifying their modern selves with an 11th century baptistry. Their high-tech vehicle, which they called their, quote, real home, end quote, offered them a new and exciting way to breathe in the Middle Ages. Although Porter studied old Europe, my research shows that many of his ideas about Romanesque art and pilgrimage took root in North American contexts. His papers demonstrate that he was acquainted with the concept of the Camino de Santiago early on, well before he made his first journey to Europe in 1904. Moreover, the Protestant New Englanders' initial encounter with medieval style religious pilgrimage did not occur in Europe, but instead in French-speaking Canada, when in 1903, he visited the shrine of Saint-Anne-de-Beaupré along the St. Lawrence River. From 1670 on, this venerable North American pilgrimage site displayed a finger bone of the Mother of the Virgin gifted to La Nouvelle France by the canons of the Cathedral of Saint-Nazaire in Carcassonne. The prestige of this relic was enhanced in 1892, just a decade before Porter's visit, when Pope Leo XIII contributed a portion of St. Anne's forearm from the Basilica of St. Paul outside the walls in Rome. This same pontiff had authenticated St. James's relics in Santiago just a few years earlier. Porter followed up on his experience of this major North American pilgrimage site, soon thereafter replaced by the huge Santiago-like neo-Romanesque basilica seen here, by crossing the Atlantic to visit the Mont Saint-Michel and Chartres immediately following his graduation from Yale in 1904. His interest in art and architectural history attracted him to these sites not the spiritual dimensions of pilgrimage. His journey to the Mont Saint-Michel was inspired by an account in an American architectural journal by Montgomery Schuyler, 
a champion of Romanesque style architecture on America's East Coast during the 1880s and 1890s, especially the work of Henry Hobson Richardson. This is an important point. Porter's fascination with European medieval art was ignited by the visual environment in which he lived in early 20th century Manhattan, where the Romanesque and Gothic were then very much living architectural languages. When he took up large format photography around 1908, he practiced his skills by documenting neo-Romanesque churches in his Upper West Side neighborhood. It was in this same context that he wrote his book on Lombard architecture after his research and honeymoon trip of 1912 to 1913. His hypotheses about the significance of the Camino as a conveyor of pilgrims and artistic ideas took shape in Manhattan. As war unfolded in Europe, Porter read Joseph Bidier's philological study, Les Légendes Épiques, started to consume Spanish discourse and studied the collections of medieval art then taking form in New York. His colleague, Georgiana Goddard King of Bryn Mawr College, herself another pioneering American scholar of the Camino, provided further provocation from 1915 on, lending him her photographs of Spanish Romanesque sculpture. An article on the rise of Romanesque sculpture written by Porter in early 1918 shows that the conceptual framework for his investigation of the art of the pilgrimage roads was in place. All that remained was to follow the Camino himself. That opportunity didn't present itself until 1920, because in August 1918, Porter and his wife Lucy sailed to Europe on this aptly named steamship, the Espagne, to assist France's Commission des Monuments Historiques with the evaluation of damage to medieval churches in the Région des Vestes, and hence to help salvage la civilisation. Although Porter's mission brought him into contact with all of the leading art scholars in Paris, his prolonged sojourn among the runescapes of Northern France during 1918 to 1919 marked a methodological turning point in his work because his intensive firsthand scrutiny of injured buildings and their architectural and sculptural fragments revealed the fallacies of France's Archaeologie Nationale, particularly its preconceived chronological structures that did not accord with the material evidence. Instead, he increasingly turned to Germanic Kunstwissenschaft or art historical science as a primary model for his subsequent research along the pilgrimage roads, valuing not only its universalizing or globalizing perspectives, but also its emphasis on Stilkritik, or an exacting stylistic analysis that permitted the art historian to sort, analyze, and classify groups of anonymously produced works and to perceive developmental sequences linking them. Porter's correspondence of 1918 to 1919, much of it written in cratered battlefields as Lucy photographed the mutilated churches, shows that he also deepened his knowledge of Hispanic scholarship. In May 1920, the Porters finally embarked on a two and a half month trip to Northern Spain. It was their only trip to the region prior to the publication of Pilgrimage Roads in 1923, and it was therefore seminal. This map approximates the sculpture hunting itinerary of these two American art pilgrims. After visiting such Romanesque churches as saint guillaume le desert along the Via Tolosana in Southern France, they crossed the Spanish frontier via train, visiting Barcelona and Montserrat before traveling on to Madrid, where they studied medieval objects in the Museo Archeologico and picked up a chauffeured car that propelled them back and forth across the medieval roads leading to and from 
the Cathedral of St. James. En route to Santiago, they marveled at churches in such cities as Avila, Salamanca, and Leon. They spent three days in Santiago admiring the polychromy of the Portico de la Gloria, studying the Puerta de las Paterias, visiting the cathedral library, and photographing other fragments of Romanesque sculpture, including this relief then positioned on the roof line of the treasury. After emulating the practices of medieval pilgrims by searching for scallop shells in Noya, they traveled to sites along the Camino Primitivo and Camino Frances, including Lugo, Oviedo, Santillana del Mar, Carrion de los Condes, Fromista, Santo Domingo de Silos, Logroño, and Santo Domingo de la Calzada. They later moved on to Catalonia, where Josep Puigy Catafalch, the only scholar in Spain with whom Porter had established contact prior to his trip, provided a list of must-see sites for them, including Lerida, San Cugat, Terrassa, and Ripoy. From there, they recrossed the Pyrenees in a new fiat, exploring such sites as Saint-Martin du Canigou, Saint-Michel du Cuxa, and Carcassonne before traveling along the Via Podiensis to Espalion, Conc, Suillac, Cahors, Moissac, Toulouse, and the west of France, mostly following the Via Turonensis. Porter was deeply impressed by the character of sculpture in Spain, writing to his brother from Burgos that the art is so different from what I am accustomed to, so intense and unrestrained, and yet with a strong appeal in many ways. At Silos, Porter was especially attracted to the, quote, singular beauty of the reliefs carved on the four corner piers of the cloister, which confirmed his view that the sculptures, like those he had seen earlier at Cluny, Santiago, and elsewhere, had been executed much earlier than French savant had acknowledged. His appreciation of Silos was enhanced by the hospitality of its monks, who invited him to join them for their evening meal in the refectory and to stay overnight in the cloister. His wife spent a far less comfortable night in a barn outside the monastic precinct, sharing it with chickens, donkeys, and a, quote, lively set of fleas, end quote. The Porter's correspondence diaries and photograph collection afford far richer insights into their adventures along the pilgrimage roads than the 10 volume book of 1923. The scholarly publication, a tool of Porter's professional legitimization was highly selective, excising a great deal. In fact, the 1500 plus images of sculpted tympana lintels, capitals, and jam figures appearing in the nine portfolio volumes represent only a small fraction of the 12,000 photographs the couple made in Italy, Spain, and France. Lucy was the chief photographer, crafting two thirds of the photographs published in her husband's book. The several generations of later scholars whose own constructions derived stimulus from the plates in Porter's book, have thus studied Romanesque sculpture through Lucy's eyes. While photographing a capital in the cloister of San Pedro in Estella, Porter unintentionally captured his wife manipulating their large format camera. This appears to be the only image of Lucy, the camera woman at work. The husband and wife team also used a smaller camera recorded here in this photograph. Porter himself did not like to be photographed, but sometimes Lucy managed to record her husband at his work, affording us precious documentation of his working methods. At the ruined monastery in Caracedo, she somehow convinced him to pose for this portrait. Lucy's diary demonstrates that at Santiago, Tarragona, Toulouse, Conque, and other sites along the way, 
her husband excitedly recognized the hands of sculptors whose work he had already detected elsewhere. Such discoveries buttressed his conception of a multi-directional sharing of ideas among itinerant artists whose manual and mental actions were responsible for the creation of innovative works at wide ranging sites along the Camino. Like the medieval artists they studied, the porters themselves were constantly on the move, similarly engaged in hand craftsmanship via photography and employing their intellects to create new ideas. And like their medieval predecessors too, these modern art pilgrims encountered difficulties en route. In their case, countless tire punctures and broken windshields on bad roads. The American couple's fieldwork along the Camino de Santiago a century ago was highly performative and experiential. They lived into its mythology, imagining themselves as pilgrims inspired by the colorful lives of the saints in the localities through which they passed. At night, after developing the day's photographs in their hotel bathrooms, they read aloud excerpts from the Codex Calixtinus published by Fidel Fita in 1882. They worked long days that often extended from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m., sometimes staying up until 2 a.m to label and catalog photographs. They delighted in hunting for remote churches, happily following mule tracks on foot or carting camera equipment on donkeys to photograph a carved lintel or tympanum. Intrepid, they climbed mountains and ladders in search of sculpted stones, setting up cameras on confessionals in churches for long exposures and blessing a fantasized Santa Fotografia when the camera slipped without causing damage to its internal mechanisms. Like other pilgrims of the past and present, the American couple reveled in what Porter described as the poetry, mystery, and inner vitality of the journey, charmed by the drama of the ever-changing landscapes, the flowers dancing in sun-drenched fields, the sound of church bells ringing, and above all, by the people they met and customs they witnessed. For them, the art of the pilgrimage roads encompassed far more than the study of the material vestiges of history. It was a totalizing experience animated by living traditions, offering them a welcome tonic from modern civilization. Their encounter with the wrecked Middle Ages in Northern France made their contact with the seemingly intact and authentic medieval past along the Camino all the more exhilarating. There is much more to the story than I can consider here, but it is important to emphasize that Spain scholars quickly recognize that Porter's research and that of his students, Kenneth Conant and Walter Muir Whitehill was transformative by evidencing the significance of the Camino's medieval visual culture and thereby embedding Silos, the Cathedral of Santiago and other sites firmly in the international consciousness, the Americans energized the project to reconstruct and revive the cult of St. James. Porter, who was named to the Royal Academy of Fine Arts of San Fernando in 1924, allied himself closely with his Spanish colleagues, persisting during the 1920s with his campaign to foreground the artistic culture of medieval Iberia. But while Romanesque sculpture of the pilgrimage roads was the work that opened the eyes and minds of the world to the art and culture of the Camino, it was also much more. One of the first publications by an American art scholar to command international attention, it is a precious document in the historiography of the practice of art history in the USA. In particular, Porter's work represents a key moment in the history of American medievalism. 
by a process of reverse colonization, the New World scholar crossed the Atlantic to redraw the artistic map of old Europe. His projection of a medieval Europe united by pilgrimage roads was on a certain level his contribution to the reconstruction of Europe after the Great War. Rich in ideas and highly experimental, Porter's publication assimilated a collage of impressions drawn from his own transcultural experiences. In a manner comparable to Abbe Warburg's Bilderatlas, of the late 1920s, Porter's publication of 1923, when studied alongside his papers, forms a giant scrapbook or palimpsest of memories in motion, suggesting provocative interconnections and intersections among ideas, motifs, histories, and temporalities. Yet the legacies of Porter and Warburg are different. Let's remember that the German scholar published very little. Only in the past 30 years has his fragmentary work become a topic of extended debate and mythologizing. The reality is that Porter, who produced more than 30 volumes of images and text prior to his death in 1933, was by far the more impactful scholar during the 20th century and in many different domains, ranging from scholarship and collecting to the preservation of cultural heritage and the formation of taste. In certain ways, the trailblazing American was to the art and visual culture of the Camino, what Warburg has imagined to have been for the Italian Renaissance. Should we not be attempting to balance this picture? Thank you very much. Gracias por su paciencia. 